We're going to go ahead and get started. I want to say thanks to Jane for those lovely pictures. <laughs> I don't know how many of our guests are here this afternoon, but I do want to I'm glad you're here, but I hope you'll forgive us a little bit of self-congratulations. We're going to kind of pat ourselves on the back and say, yay, 25, and then we'll go drink. So, <laughs> um, Basically, what you're going to have is a little film. It's a, just a little slideshow and uh, with a voiceover. And we'll do some acknowledgments and presentations. There'll be a little bit of interactive participation. And um, first off, I want to start with a nice uh, letter from Ixom from the President Bruce Ridge that uh, Paul is going to read for us. This is from Bruce Ridge, uh, Chairman, Chairperson of the uh, International Conference of Symphony and Orchestra Musicians, Ixom, for those who, of you who are, I'm sure, aware. He says, on behalf of the Ixam Governing Board, please accept my best wishes for an enjoyable and successful MOLA conference. We hope you all feel the support of Ixam as you gather to discuss the issues before you. The musicians of our orchestras realize that their work would be impossible without yours. Ixam has been proud to have had a number of librarians serve as delegates to our conference over the years. At least two have also served on our Governing Board, those being our esteemed friend Mary Plain of Baltimore, and currently Paul Gunther of the Minnesota Orchestra. We hope that even more librarians will serve their orchestras through Ixom as more librarians become members of our bargaining units under our collective bargaining agreements. I regret that I'm unable to join you in Chicago this weekend, but hopefully future scheduling will allow me to visit with you all. Everyone at Ixom looks forward to building our already strong relationship with MOLA and our orchestra's librarians. With my best wishes always, Bruce Ridge, Chair Ixom. Thank thanks, you. Karen. That's marvelous. Please give our thanks to the whole Ixom Governing Board. I want to thank all of our sponsors. Uh, this is not a commercial, but our sponsors have been very, very generous. And um, you will see their names in the back of the program. You will see the signs at each event. And I want to thank... Um, <coughs> Leon Gallison and Kalmus for their support this afternoon uh, for events during this conference. It's really been a tremendous help, and uh, we appreciate it very much. And so we'll now have our little show. <laughs> the 1983 gathering of 25 librarians in Philadelphia has almost a quarter century later reached near mythic proportions. The day-long meeting in the Philadelphia Orchestra Library, the caravan of cars to Clinton Newig's 18th century farmhouse for a Pennsylvania Dutch meal, the first officers gathering in Clint's laundry room. Veteran hotshots pass the story down to neophytes just out of school who in turn sing song the tales amongst themselves like bouncy kindergartners reciting the history of Washington crossing the Delaware. <laughs> Today, in 2007, we take our library community as a given. We no longer focus on how to communicate and make improvements to our work, but instead have myriad committees working on such ambitious goals as forming liaisons with other organizations, educating composers, and conquering the world. In addition, not only does MOLA have multiple committees working as I type toward, among other things, the goals listed above, but it also has subcommittees. That's right, just like the Senate. Our 501c3 tax status establishes us as a certified tax-exempt nonprofit in the eyes of the government. But we're a headline-producing scandal shy of solidifying ourselves as a real-world, real organization. We have sponsors, passwords, controversies, and even a few marriages. MOLA has arrived. While a quarter century is an impressive age for the little organization that could, it's not such a long time that many of the founding parental units 
are not still with us and actively involved in Mo. And so we know from these people who were there at the beginning that although this first conference was, due to its inaugural nature, light on policy discussion and devoid of constitution constructing, it did initiate the change from librarians working in solitude to association members leaning upon one another for support. Larry Tarlow, the principal librarian of the New York <laughs> Philharmonic and three-term MOLA president, sums it up this way. We discussed publishers and conductors and the condition of materials, although I don't remember any great ground being broken. In fact, a lot of it was, oh, you're so-and-so. Very few of us had met face-to-face. I met John Van Winkle for the first time that day, Clint Newig, Lou Robbins, everyone except for Victor Albert I met for the first day. No one knew each other, but we were solving problems independently, inventing the wheel. And if the guy in the next valley has already invented the wheel, ah, uh, well. <laughs> it made sense. Why struggle through a complicated research project if someone had already done it? Or on the flip side, why struggle through that complicated research project and then put it away when you could share it with another ensemble? Why guess at the particulars of an edition for a guest conductor when you could call the librarian of his regular orchestra? But nobody knew each other. And that's why having people together for this session in Philadelphia was so important. The first part of this meeting was on a Friday in March of 1983. The part that is so frequently neglected in the myriad retellings took place in and nearby the Academy of Music, home of the Philadelphia Orchestra. At the invitation of the orchestra librarians, Clint Newig, Nancy Bradbird, and Bob Grossman, 22 orchestra librarians and three guests, representing the American Symphony Orchestra League, the Flasher Collection, and the New England Conservatory, people from Boston to San Francisco congregated to compare notes on a melange of motives peculiar to their profession. The agenda set in advance by Clint, Jim Birdall from the Minnesota Orchestra, and Victor Albert from the Boston Symphony, was typed neatly on Philadelphia Orchestra stationery and included music acquisition, new technology, library policies, library resources, and copyright. Interestingly enough, these first discussions sounded very much like the ones we have today. How can we better work with publishers? How should we handle on-deposit loan sets? What's the protocol for POPs preparation? John Tafoya, principal librarian of the St. Louis Symphony, says, it was reassuring to discuss concerns each of us had in dealing with our respective orchestras, musicians, and management, and learning that we shared the same problems. We all shared a newfound experience through that meeting. It was fun to exchange stories we had through our experiences with conductors and musicians, and finding the humor in many of those experiences. One other topic discussed that first day was errata in published parts and resource suggestions for obtaining lists of corrections. Clint explains how the Philadelphia Orchestra Library's obsessive proofreading for errors got started. One day, he says, Ricardo Muti came to me and said that he didn't like to stop in rehearsal for questions about whether this note was a B-flat or a B-natural or those sort of things, and could we do anything about it. I told him that we'd try to check sources and parts, and that's how we got started making errata lists and correcting the material. Eventually, we took it one step further, and Kalmus agreed that they would publish the editions. Today, these oft-requested sets of scores and parts, known as the Niewig editions, number 58, with more in production. Back in 1983, just that Clint was able to make the time to so thoroughly proofread important sets of standard repertoire was a revelation to many librarians. In the September 2003 Marcato tribute to Clint, Marcia Farabee, principal librarian of the National Symphony and two-time MOLA president, wrote of the impact that meeting him had on her career, adding, I had heard stories about the high level of service in Philly, that their library did proofing, and their music was ready many weeks in advance. After Moody's request, proofing became the norm in Philadelphia, made possible by scrupulous time management and librarians who trained during these years in Philadelphia cannot fathom putting new material on the stands without an exhaustive correction phase.